The following program is presented by the Theosophical Society in America. In the last four programs, we have taken just a short glimpse of some of the great universal principles operating both in our world and in ourselves. We also took a broad and sweeping look at the way evolution operates from a theosophical perspective and what that means for humanity as a whole. In our final program, we are going to turn our attention to individual evolution. What is it in each one of us that evolves? And what is our role throughout? To begin answering these questions, we need to first return to our diagram of the sevenfold human nature, discussed in detail in Program 3. And you remember the upper triad is Atma, Buddhi, and Manas. Atma being the ground of existence, Venus itself, in a way inexpressible, but the ultimate reality which we are and buddhi being wisdom itself, truth itself, many things can be said of it, but nonetheless a universal as well. And those two aspects, which are in fact one in the existent world, finally are focused onto the mirror of mind and come alive in us, in the human mind. And therein lies our individuality, as we expressed, as we mentioned before, the knower, the one who knows. And it is said that it is that that evolves. But we must look a little bit, I think, at first to see what it is that we call me. Because we don't think of ourselves that way, do we, really? Uh, Blavatsky suggests that between buddhi manas and kama manas, that juncture between those two functions of mind, where the mind begins to look not inward but outward toward the objects of sense. She suggests that that is where the sense of I develops. And that develops into what we call the personal ego. And I would like to differentiate that from this individuality in the background and try to give people some sense of what it is we mean when we talk about the personal ego, which must be destroyed, because we talk about that a lot and it seems so contrary to sense, doesn't it? If I am to grow and uh, learn and reincarnate, what does it mean to destroy myself? It sounds completely contradictory. Well, of course, it doesn't mean we destroy ourself. What it means is we destroy an illusion, something that isn't really ourselves, but with which we have so thoroughly identified that for all practical purposes, it is ourself. Let me just say how I think that builds up in us. Each human being is born an infant. And you know, for a while, that infant is unaware even of physical boundaries. Isn't it so that an infant will wave their arms around in the air and after a time take a bite out of it? Well, if they knew the words, they'd say, ouch, that hurts, that must be me. But of course, they don't have words for it, but they learn very quickly that that thing floating around in the air up there is attached and somehow is part of themselves. So they begin very, we as human beings, begin very early on to get a sense of our own physical limitations, where I begin and the world takes on, you see? So that is learned. But now bit by bit, the individual begins to learn who he or she is. And we say to a little boy baby, you are a little boy. To a girl, you are a little girl. This is what little boys do. This is what little girls do. And we get that kind of thing, which varies from culture to culture. So we get that sense starting off with us. And then let's take two extreme cases and see how we most likely fit somewhere in the middle. If we take first a very negative case and say a child is born in a very 
broken up dysfunctional family where perhaps there's not even a father available and where the mother is only there on alternate weeks or whatever. And the child is born in a, in a ghetto area where life seems rather worthless and meaningless. That individual may like, may very well get an extremely negative point of view about themselves, isn't it so? Now, the other extreme is an individual might be born in a very loving family. In fact, maybe one that can be a little bit too loving, if I dare say such a thing. And the individual is looked upon as God's greatest gift to the human race. The child can do no wrong. The child is the most beautiful. The child is the most intelligent who ever walked the face of the earth. And when that child grows up, that child may likely give God daily advice. So that individual, you see, might have a very exaggerated image of themselves. Both are false, of course, ultimately. Now, what happens in that self-image is not just what we're told. It's very much the way we respond to the world, how the world affects us. Let me take another simple example to see how this self-image with its qualities gets built in us and becomes very, very firm. Let's take something like public speaking. You've been watching a speaker and you've watched many speakers and listened to many speakers of all sorts, from politicians to theosophists. And you might say to yourself, some of you, oh, I wish I could get up and not be afraid of talking before an audience, but I'm a very shy person. Now, I have no idea uh, how that might have come about in various individuals, but let's take a hypothetical case. Let's say early on in experience, in school maybe, in kindergarten or in first grade, perhaps an individual was called upon to do something in front of the class and they made a fool of themselves, or at least they thought they did. They said something which made everybody laugh at them. That hurts, doesn't it? It really hurts, especially a young child. And the memory of that may stick there for a very long time indeed. Now, what I'm getting at with this hypothetical case, and these are all oversimplified, you understand. Uh, what I'm getting at is that that individual might, from that experience, now start to learn a way of handling that kind of thing and the way the individual may choose, not necessarily choose, may choose is to keep quiet in public places, never to say anything. Now the individual thinks of themselves as shy, you see. Oh, I couldn't get up in front of a public group and do anything. But it's nonsense. You really can do that because you're human. And what one human being can do within certain limitations, every human being can do. So you see, we have identified, therefore, with a particular way of responding to the world. And so our me, the Ed, the Jack, the Mary, the Jane, actually becomes a pattern of thinking and feeling, a way of thinking and feeling. And we begin to assign to ourselves qualities as though those qualities are a permanent part of our nature and in unchangeable. Now, even in modern psychology, this is known to be false. What is an analyst always trying to do? Convince the client or the patient that what happened 40 years ago is gone, dead, that they have an opportunity to live differently now, not to identify with that little child who had a particular experience. So this human ego, in a way, is this complex pattern of thinking and feeling, which is a process, really, a process, but a static one if we identify with it thoroughly. It's that kind of thing with which we have identified. Now comes along this idea of spiritual evolution or spiritual life or self-transformation. And we are apt to fall into a very deep trap. We are apt to think that this me is the thing which is going to grow. It is the thing which is the problem not the thing which is going to grow. It's what has to be gotten rid of, not that which has to be grown. Another example, a caterpillar. One caterpillar talking to another caterpillar one day was looking up in the sky and saw a magnificent butterfly. And he said to his buddy, you're never going to get me up in one of those. Well, it's a little like us. We want to be a better 
and a bigger caterpillar. You see the foolishness. What has to happen? The caterpillar must be dissolved, isn't it so? Into an amorphous fluid. And out of that, resurrected into a freer, more beautiful creature. And so it is in this idea of uh, self-transformation. The personal ego needs to be dissolved. And we sh alluded to the idea of the eggshell in the last session, I believe, where we, from within that carapace, must begin to peck uh, at the outer uh, fringes until it is broken and until we can emerge really fully conscious at those deeper levels identified there and not identified with that process that we call the personal ego. Now, personality is not uh, wiped out. If you look at the Mahatma letters, you will see that there is a very distinct personality in Maurya and another very different personality in Kutumi. They do not operate in the same way. Kutumi, when you read his letters, and I hope you will, you will find a person who expresses himself in flowing terms, gentle terms. Uh, he presents himself to the world in a cultivated manner. Moria, on the other hand, who is not so familiar with the Western mind as Kutumi was, uh, presents himself in a very blunt, crisp manner, not one who liked to write letters at all, took the task on only as a favor to his uh, friend Kutumi when the uh, opportunity was there and when it was uh, something he needed to do. So you find very distinct personalities, but you don't find differences in their understanding of the principles. They identify always at that deeper level, though they express themselves in their own unique way. So uniqueness will always be the case but the identity with the process called the personal ego will not. Now, this conscious evolution begins, I think, with three questions. You remember in the evolutionary process we talked about with the race as a whole, up to the human race, that is, things were passive. We said that when the human being comes along, then there must be conscious direction. And that begins, I think, with three very fundamental questions. It begins very often in people who would never, ever think of these questions as being spiritual. These questions are, who am I? Where did I come from? And what is the purpose of it all? Children, I think, often ask this question, where did I come from? Maybe they're only five years old, four years old, and the parents say, oh my God, they've asked about sex already. What should I say? I don't think that's what they're asking. I think what a child asks when they say that is, where did I come from? Not how did this physical body get here? They have a sense of the I deep within them, and when they're aware of that I, they want to know where did it come from? So the question is really a spiritual question, and it may get dropped in life until much, much later on. And then when life gets difficult and when things don't make much sense, very often we turn back to that and ask the question again, where did I come from? What are my roots? And then the ultimate question, uh, which is finally maybe in the universal sense unanswerable, why? What is the purpose. So those questions really begin the spiritual life from within. The belief systems don't matter very much one way or another uh, because they just give us simple answers and which don't really satisfy deep within. So what do we do then? If we mean that and we really long to understand, then there's the beginning of something. But without an inner longing an inner quest, a deep thirst from the depths of one's being to understand, then nothing happens. We have to really want to understand in the deepest and strongest way. Uh, there is a story of St. Augustine who says, God make me a good boy, but not yet. And that, I think, sums us up pretty much, doesn't it? 
we want to do the right thing, we want to grow, but when we're having a good time, we say not yet. We'd rather wait a bit. And then there's the wonderful story of the Indian guru and his student, and the student says to him, what must I do to obtain enlightenment? Rather simplistic question, and the guru knows perfectly well he doesn't really want enlightenment, so he shows him by action what must be done. And they're by a river, as many of you may know, and he takes the student's head and pushes it down into the river, and when the student can hardly stand it anymore, when he's near expiration, the guru pulls him out of the river and says to him, what did you want most when you were under the water? And the student says, oh, air. And the guru says, when you want enlightenment that badly, it will be yours. We want it, but we want it a little bit, and then we want other things and then we come back and want it a little bit more. So you see, it takes that inner, inner longing to understand. Now, when we have that, or at least when we have a little bit of it, because none of us have it that strongly, I suppose, I certainly can speak for myself, uh, when we have even a little bit of it, we begin the search. Where do we search? What way? The Secret Doctrine is a wonderful book of guideposts, of signposts. It's a kind of a pointer in directions. And there are essentially two directions in which to search. And they are infinite, really, both. It comes right from that initial polarity that we talked about. You see, I was not kidding when I said in the beginning that those fundamental realities were applicable at every stage, at every point, all along, and even in our spiritual search. There's basically two directions, isn't there? The polarity, the within and the without. We can't just do one, or we won't come to the enlightenment. We won't understand how the whole fits together, which is what enlightenment is. We must do both. We must search without, which is the Western dominant method, the within being the Eastern dominant method. But let's take Western first. Let's look out, we say. Study. Know what's going on in the world. Understand something of scientific principles. Not being a scientist, I don't mean, but understanding what we can of science. Looking out and understanding something of the history of the human race. Uh, remembering that, as one person once said, history is agreed upon falsehood, so one has to be careful what history books one reads and remember who wrote them. But nonetheless, we can learn something from history, uh, from sociology, from psychology, outer study, study of the secret doctrine, study of the spiritual literature. But most of all, observation of this world and especially of how we affect others. It is very easy for us to know how others affect us. It's not difficult at all. But it is terribly, terribly difficult for us. And I sp speak out of my own experience always, at least I try always to speak out of my own experience. It's terribly difficult for us to understand how we affect other people. That is something we need to learn and to be aware. So there's a kind of an outer uh, observation. And then there is the other way around, toward the other pole of, re of infinite reality. And that is to look within. Looking within does not mean into the personal ego. It means beyond it, to that quiet, still, non-reactive point within us that point which simply observes and does not react. Looking in that way, called meditation by whatever method, then one can get insights. Now there are two dangers in this as well as the two roots. For those who look only out and never look in, that individual may well become a materialist and hedonist. Only what I see, touch, and feel is real. Everything else is false. If I only look out, that may be my conclusions. But for the likes of many of us who are interested in the spiritual life and spiritual matters, 
the larger danger lies on the inner path. We may say, I am an intuitive person. I rely on my intuitions. Well, that's all right if they really are intuitions. But we must find out whether they are or not. So we go within and maybe have some intuitive flashes, but then we must see if we're true theosophists or true students of theosophy, I should say, then we must see how that intuition relates to the exterior world because these two poles are one. And that being so, there must be relationships. We must see how the whole fits together. And we mustn't be like people who are so convinced of their own ideas and their own beliefs that never under any circumstances will they be confused by fact. We have to be open and be willing to see whether our pet theories, whether our intuitions are really intuitions, or whether they are wishful thinking or just distortions of reality. Now, we've said something about the quest. We've said something about the directions of the search, out and in. Now, we have to say something about the life, because there's a very curious idea in theosophy, uh, and that is, in the words of H.P. Blavatsky, he who would come to the wisdom must live the life. What a strange statement, in a way. Why can't we just learn about theosophy and wisdom like we learn about calculus, like we learn about history? We can't, because to become wise, we must change ourselves. We can get knowledge, can't we? Fact. That's not so hard. Not easy, maybe, in many cases, but we can get facts. But to become wise, you see, even in our language, we say a person is wise. We can get knowledge. We don't talk about getting wisdom so much, do we? We say becoming wise, or there is a wise person. So even in our language, we sense something of this. There are changes within oneself that allow oneself, finally, through those changes, to grasp the whole of it. And if our mind is so centered on the personal ego, so wrapped up in that, our mind is incapable of really understanding the whole. So it requires a change within ourselves. It requires the living of a, of a selfless life, really. And all the great spiritual teachers have said that. We don't like that so much, do we, as human beings? I speak for all of us, I think, certainly for myself. We don't like that. We, we would much rather hear that it's not a selfless life, but a life where we can just do what we want and have a good time. But yet all the great spiritual teachers have said it is necessary to lead a selfless life. That selfless life, according to Blavatsky, is not simply one of self-denial. It is a life of active altruism. In The Voice of the Silence, she writes... Let thy soul lend its ear to every cry of pain, like as the lotus bears its heart to drink the morning sun. Let not the fierce sun dry one tear of pain before thyself hast wiped it from the sufferer's eye. But let each burning human tear drop on thy heart and there remain, nor ever brush it off until the pain that caused it is removed. But how might one begin a life dedicated to active altruism? For many years, the Theosophical Society has suggested a practice it calls the three limbs of the spiritual life as a way of fostering this quality of selfless action in the student. The three limbs in this practice are study, meditation, and service. The first is clear study. The outer search, you see, as we talked about. Looking out, finding out what we can, learning what we can as well. The second, meditation, searching within, going within, seeing how those two relate. The third sounds a bit strange, service. But the essence of the selfless life is to move away from this personal ego. And do you see how service does that? Study does it, pulls us away from the personal ego. 
meditation goes beyond the personal ego inwardly, and service, by very definition, takes us away from the personal ego. And by those three limbs of the theosophical life, one actually diminishes the power of the personal ego. And bit by bit, one begins to identify with something far deeper in oneself. Now, this philosophy has come, really, from those individuals called the masters of the wisdom. The two about whom we know something are by name Kutumi and Moria. And H.P. Blavatsky, the founder of the modern theosophical movement, was familiar in her psychic visions with one of those two, Moria, throughout her childhood, and in her young adult life met him in London physically, not a psychic vision, and others saw him as well. So he is a real physical human being. He said to her at the time of the meeting uh, that he and his colleague wanted very much to bring some of these ideas into the West because they felt the West was ready for some of these ideas and that it would be helpful to humanity. He stressed his own humanity. And if you think about it, if you accept this idea of conscious evolution, the changing, growing process within us, Masters or adepts are a logical necessity to this because there would have to be those who know far more than us. So he felt that the West was ready for some of these ideas that they understood. I think the masters might be thought of as fully human beings. And we might think of ourselves as human beings in the making. We haven't quite made it yet. We act more like the animals in the sense that we are reactive. That's what animals do, don't they? They react. They don't think about what they're doing. They react to what's in front of them. And if we watch ourselves, I'm sorry to say, most of the time that's what we're doing, reacting, not consciously doing something really from a deeper level, but really just reacting to the circumstances in front of us. So they apparently, have developed the full potential of the human being and have an enormous amount of knowledge, they claim, uh, about the principles of this, our solar system, and beyond it, they say, we only make reasonable assumptions. While the Mahatmas, Maurya and Kutumi, were interested in bringing to the Western world the esoteric teachings of various religious traditions, they were also interested in science and the impact it could have on spiritual life. In one of the letters, not actually in the Mahatma letters to A.P. Sinnott, but in a series edited by one of the early international presidents of the Theosophical Society, Jinaraja Dasa, uh, there is a letter from actually a superior to Mahatma Kutumi and Maurya, one whom they regard as knowing more than they do. And in that letter, the individual says, the doctrine we promulgate must become ultimately triumphant as every other truth. Yet, it is absolutely necessary to inculcate it gradually, enforcing its theories with direct evidence furnished by modern exact science. Now, I find a hundred years after the publication of this, remarkable evidence that that is indeed happening because where are the greatest pieces of evidence for this philosophy uh, coming? Where are they coming from? From modern physics. H.P. Blavatsky said from these individuals because she got it from them way back in the late 1800s, 1880s, she died in 91, 1891, she said that the cornerstone of occultism or theosophical philosophy rested upon the elusive nature of matter and the infinite divisibility of the atom. She said it at a time when the physicists were convinced that atoms were little billiard balls bouncing against one another in the universe. And what do modern physicists say now about matter? We don't know what matter is. Isn't that 
a proof of the elusive nature of matter? That, to me, is evidence for the existence of these beings far more than anything else. And then, on the other hand, she said this at a time about the infinite divisibility of the atom when they didn't think it was splittable at all. And every year it split more. More and more subatomic particles, isn't it so? Not split at all until the mid-1940s. They knew because they had studied deeply and learned for themselves the nature of this universe and the nature of their own being. Now, as to the spiritual life, they have quite a bit to say. First of all, they indicate that to transform ourselves, we can't expect to do it overnight. This is one of my, my problems with a lot of the simple literature that's out now about the spiritual life. It's lovely to have simple literature, but it's not lovely to have simplistic literature, and some of it is indeed very simplistic. They suggest that when we start this process, it's going to take a while. In fact, they say this, it draws forth the dormant vices as well as the dormant virtues. The process of self-purification, or we might say transformation, is not the work of a moment nor of a few months, but of years, nay, extending over a series of lifetimes. The later a human being begins to live the higher life, the longer must be the period of probation. For the individual must undo the effects of long numbers of years spent in objects diametrically opposed to the real goal. You see, the laws of motion are operative even in the spiritual world. If we have built up an inertia, a movement of, of a particular way of being over centuries, over many lives, do you think that in five seconds we can just make an affirmation and have it all change? No, but we can start, you see. This is the great hope. We don't have to say, I can't do anything just because the job is big. We have to start. So they say, don't think it's going to happen overnight. Then they say about freedom. The individual is absolutely free to do whatever because we grow that way. We really grow by making our own decisions and learning from our own mistakes. And so it's important that we be allowed to make our mistakes. They say, for example, that if one wants to be a student of theirs, that is a very close relationship with them, which was something they did at least for a while. Whether they do it now, I do not know. But they say if one wants to be really close to them and learn directly from them, then they must put you on probation for a while to see what you're going to do. Anybody, because they are not omniscient. They don't know exactly what you might do or what I might do. They need to watch for a while and see. And they say, if you think you're watched every minute, of course you're going to behave in a certain way. If you're just going to be left on your own, we'll see what you'll do under the circumstances. Now, selfishness, they say, is the greatest impediment on the spiritual path. And selfishness is not only the usual kind of selfishness with which we are familiar, but there's a kind of inner selfishness that they point out as being far more dangerous. When we become so self-complacent that we regard our ideas of the right and the wrong as being the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, we lapse into inner selfishness. So we must be very, very careful. He mentions it in the following way. There are those who will follow the path once chosen by them with their eyes closed to the interests of all but themselves and see nothing outside the narrow pathway filled with their own personality. They are so intensely absorbed in the contemplation of their own supposed righteousness that nothing can ever appear right to them outside the focus of their own vision distorted by their self-complacent contemplation and their judgment of the right and the wrong. Also, they say we need to learn to be impersonal, not to be devoted to individuals, to persons, to personalities, to divinities, to them least of all. At one point, Kutumi said to uh, Sinet, learn to be loyal to the idea rather than my poor self. And then they say, Motive to us is everything. What we mean to do is far imp more important than the mistakes we make 
when we mean to do something and slip up. It's the intention, it's the heart, the inner intention, which is far more important from their point of view than the mistakes we make along the way, from which, of course, we learn. And now I'd like to come to a conclusion here and to say something about how difficult this life is, and yet, this is spiritual life is, and yet how rewarding. Because after all, nothing worthwhile in life is easy, is it? If we look at the great athletes, the Olympic, the Olympic athletes, look at the work, look at the tremendous work and the difficulty they went through. Joyfully though, even though painfully, they always say the spiritual life is joyful. Smile, Mother Teresa always says, doesn't she? Looking at the most wretched of our human race, she still wants people to smile, to be happy, to be joyful. That's part of the spiritual life, the joy. But there's lots of hard work and there's lots of difficulties in the way. And when Sinnott asked about this, he thought it was going to be a one, two, three, just teach me some things and I can be an adept too soon. Well, he was to be forgiven. He didn't know anything about any of this. And I'm sure I would have been in his shoes as well if I didn't know any better at the time. But in answer to this idea that Sinnott had in his mind about it being easy and he'd just be a student and learn a lot as if he were in school, Kutumi wrote to him and said the following, and it's really said to us as well. You were told, however, that the path to occult sciences has to be trodden laboriously and crossed at the danger of life. That every new step in it leading to the final goal is surrounded by pitfalls and by cruel thorns. That the pilgrim who ventures upon it is first made to confront and to conquer the thousand and one furies who keep watch over its adamantine gates and entrance. Furies called doubt, skepticism, ridicule, scorn, envy, and finally temptation, especially the latter. And that he who would see beyond had first to destroy this living wall you see, that's partly the personal ego, I think, the living wall. That he must be possessed of a heart and soul clad in steel and of an iron, never failing determination and yet be meek and gentle, humble, and have shut out from his heart every human passion that leads to evil. Are you all this? Well, of course we're not. None of us are. But we aspire to it, you see. And lest we think it's too much, I want to end with one word from the masters to each of us. They said, we have one word for all aspirants. Try. <laughs>